go ahead and start us off. Sure. Happy Friday, Kenny. Hold Rubino Devils Digest. Uh, you brought in an unprecedented number of uh, transfer portal players, just around 25. Uh, you had um, over 30 um, newcomers when you factor in uh, high school and junior college ranks when fall camp starts. You're probably going to have uh, that number of total 50. Um, when you um, recruit so many players, you obviously expect them to make immediate impact. But sometimes when you have a large quantity, you can have as many number of misses as you have bullseyes. Were you pleasantly surprised when you saw so many newcomers uh, really make their presence known all throughout the 15 spring practices? And how much importance does that bring to setting the foundation uh, going into fall camp? Yeah, well, I think uh, two parts of that question. One, not every player we bring in is supposed to make an immediate impact, right? Due to the situation we were in, where our scholarships were allocated when we got here in terms of not having a lot of guys in the 2022 freshman class, Right. We're going to have to. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little bit sick. I usually get sick after long stretches of no sleep. Mm. Uh, but uh, so you use so we have to balance our roster with enough youth. Right. You can't play 60 guys. Right. So if you bring in 60 guys that anticipate to start right now, it's going to be hard for your culture uh, to really wrap around that. So you got to be really honest with the guys in recruiting, and then you got to build enough youth in there that it's not 60 guys that are ready to play yet, 80 guys that are ready to play yet, right? You can stagger your roster. So we're in process of doing that. And then in terms of was I happy with the guys brought in? Yes. It's a testament to our coaches in terms of evaling guys, evaling guys from small schools, evaling guys from big schools that never got an opportunity. Right. There's always uh, so many, I mean, guys I've coached in the past have been written off and said, you know, they're not good. And then they go and become top Heisman candidates. So, I mean, you got to find the right guys uh, to bring into your pro program. And that's the character piece. And I think that's what I'm most pleased with is we brought in guys with good character and they have talent. Otherwise, we wouldn't have recruited them, but they have good character. Hey, Kenny, Chris Carmen, I know source. Um, the NCAA suspended the uh, 25 uh, new scholarship uh, last summer. So this is the first year that anybody's gone through uh, this with such a large uh, ability to add players. How different is the situation that you're in now versus what would have been the case had that rule still be still been in effect? And how how benefited are you by that? <laughs> well, We'd be in trouble if the rule wasn't in effect. I mean, it just the, the amount of scholarships that we had on the roster when we took over, uh, we wouldn't have been able to make it up. Uh, we're based off the old rules. So we would have been two, three, maybe a fourth year away from getting back to 85. Uh, with the current day and age of college football, with the transfer portal and the amount of scholarships we had, it would have been really hard for us to make up the 85. Uh, in the next two to three years. So that definitely allowed us uh, to get back to 85. Um, and it allowed us to really, uh, you know, try to get some guys who fit the culture we're trying to build. But it's it's it was essential. I mean, it was essential. Hi, Kenny. Michelle Gardner, Arizona Republic. Wanted to ask you about uh, positions of need. And it, it appears that offensive line, you said before, is one position. You're still looking for guys. Can you kind of talk about the situations with Walden and Frost as far as what their injuries were? And do you expect to be up to that complement of linemen that you need by the fall? I can. One sec. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so Frost came in, uh, he heard his ACL last year in Nevada. Uh, and uh, so we, he could have practiced this spring towards the end. We just held him out. Uh, he is hundred percent healthy now. Uh, like I said, if we were in season, he would have pushed it to play because he was cleared to play. We just figured with his experience, there wasn't a point to push him back from that. Uh, and Bram just had uh, something minor. Uh, so he will be back, uh, like I said, the only guy who's got an injury, uh, you know, was we already discussed him uh, in terms of that will be out for a while. So um, other than that, we're, we're, we got through spring with a physical, physical spring, uh, fairly healthy, which is, I mean, we padded practice 12 days. There were no shorts. It was either the maximum amount of padded practice we were allowed to pad. We were padded full pads. Uh, 
Mitch, you know, that's not something that we're going to hopefully do moving forward, but it's something that we needed to do in year one to build the culture. Hey, Coach, Jordan Ham, Sports 360 AZ. Um, kind of piggybacking off of the influx of, of guys that you've been able to bring in, just what's been your approach um, and this staff's approach in terms of, you know, player development and, and you know, where each – benchmark you want to heat, hit each year and how that how that has looked here in the first couple of months here in Tempe yeah we just got want guys to get better every day I mean you there's two sides of development I mean in order to develop right you have to practice hard you have to physically practice and do things so I think the the amount of work our guys put into practice I mean I showed the guys at the end of it uh, you know our total work per practice was basically 45 percent higher than their total work uh, in years prior. So it was really good for them to see that the work is being put in to grow and to get better. Uh, but that's where the young guys on the roster, uh, hopefully we can develop and build. And that's why we had a lot of high school kids that we signed because you have to fill that void at the back of your roster with kids that need to be developed. So uh, I think it's essential in the development piece. And I think that's why if you look at the, even the staff I hired, I hired a group of guys that, you know, our developers, our football coaches, uh, our guys that maybe haven't been to the biggest school possible. They're not, they've been at the schools that they've had to develop people and adapt what they do around their personnel. Hi coach. Um, I got two, one's kind of a follow-up based on what you say. Number one, how is spring juice recruiting what are you feeling like? Is it going Maricopa County, state of Arizona wise as you thought? Not as good. What kind of energy are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's going in the right direction. I think anybody who thinks it's just gonna flip, oh, I'm back. And it just flips is uh very short-sighted. This is a process uh that we recruiting now nowadays happens two to three years in advance for the top prospects. So we're trying to get the top prospects in the state here, and that's going to take a few years. Obviously, we're already ahead of the curve, in my opinion, right now. Uh, currently, we're ahead of where I thought we could be, and I think that's only continued, going to continue to grow here uh, in this signing class. But I think year in, year after, year in, year out, year in, year out, it's going to slowly get better and better and better because we're going to have better relationships with these guys. And my yes. third one then is, and feel free to rip me if I'm making this up, because I know you're, fr I know how you feel about this state. I know you how you feel about beating U of A, but listening to the hype of Colorado, the hype of Dion, them already selling out their tickets, and both of you being first year head coaches, do you feel a hidden juice, a hidden rivalry against Colorado that hasn't been spoken since you're both in your first term here. Do you, are you bumping into Colorado on the recruiting trail? Not at all. I mean, I'm not, I know it's coaching cliche. I literally could care less about any other program. Like I'm worried about us. Like people say recruiting matters too. And it's the lifeblood of a program. Yes, it does. But the most important part of a program is your current players. So I put 80% of my time and do things that affect our current players. 80%. I'm not worried about any other program, any other place. I'm worried about our guys, what I can do to help our guys get better. And then the other 20%, what can I do, right, to bring more guys into the program? But college football is a culture profession. It's everybody thinks it's a talent acquisition. There's an important piece to acquire talent. But talent without culture right doesn't win the culture has to come first in order to win with the talent hey coach Cole top from devil's digest uh, we've seen coach mons you know tweet at basically every single high school that he's been to this week how important is it for coaches to be visible from a, a social media perspective when out recruiting as opposed to kind of just keeping a low profile on the road taking the visits i mean i'm gonna be honest there you could argue both sides because for every school you tweet out there's another school saying why didn't you see us yet right so it's it's a you know everything you do on social has two sides to the coin i love the fact that he's out there uh tweeting it out locally because i think we're going to hit most of the schools in this state locally so we'll we'll be able to combat that but when we're out on the road nationally you know we may hop into a, a california 
hop into a Texas, hop into an Alabama and go see, you know, three schools. Well, you don't necessarily want to advertise. You only went to those three schools because there's going to be four other schools right next to them that were like, why don't you come see me? So I think there is a strategic balance to that. And that strategic balance is in state and in your extremely primary recruiting areas where you know you're going to hit all of those schools. Hi, Coach. Jen Ortiz, Arizona Republic. Um, I just wanted to know, what did you learn from your staff seeing them in action over the spring practice? I mean, they're good teachers and they have energy. Like football is how much, what can you get out of somebody? Like I give you blank. What do you get out of him in the meeting room? What do you get about him on the football field? Does he believe in your vision, right? When you coach him, right? Doesn't, nothing else matters other than can you communicate your information and can you get this guy to play passionately, right? And uh, I think sitting in meetings, uh, I think our coaches were really good at teaching and really organized at teaching. And then out on the field, we had enough juice. And not everybody's the same by design. We have a whole bunch of different personalities out there. So everybody does it in their own way. And that's an important piece of uh, coaching staff is there's not 11 Kenny Dillinghams. They're not 11 Charlie Regals, not 11 Rashad Samples. You need one of each personality. And if you get too many of the same, right, that's when you can only relate to a certain percentage of your players. <laughs> hey, Coach, uh, Robbie Baker with Fox 10. Good to see you. Good to uh, see you. Yeah. Um, now that we're, I guess, about a week or so removed from the end of spring and you've got a chance to dive into some more tape maybe, I'm just curious what you liked about the competition in that quarterback room and how important is the next couple months in the summer for those guys' individual development to maybe start getting some separation once we get to fall? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, you know, you put a bunch of guys, um, you know, getting reps with four to five guys is hard, for lack of a better term, uh, hard. But we told everybody that we brought in we were going to give them an opportunity. Uh, so, and I'm a man of my word, so we did. Uh, was that, you know, ideal? No. Uh, but I think it was necessary. So, but now moving forward, I mean, we're going to, we've talked to the guys about, you know, what guys we see in this quarterback battle. We've talked to what guys we see as guys who could potentially steal it away uh, if they continue to progress. So our, our rep count in fall camp will be drastically different. Uh, we'll go in with two quarterbacks battling and another guy progressing and well, one to two guys kind of progressing behind them to see uh, if they can surpass them. Mark McLuhan, you can go ahead. Hey, good morning, Coach. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, sorry. It's early. Um, regarding the rest of the summer and when you start preparing for the season, I uh, hope you get the feeling better here. Um, how much time off will you take? How much time have you even had since you took this job? And when do you start putting the game plan and looking at uh, how you attack Southern Utah and Oklahoma State coming up here? Yeah, time off, uh, that'll happen in the end of June for a little bit, July a little bit. Uh, other than that, I got to get out. I got to be seen. I got to get meet with donors, uh, you know, go on campus more and meet with different parts of the building, right? This is year one. So this is not, you know, year four, year 10 here, where this time of year will be me fine tuning my handicap in golf. Uh, this is year one. So I got to go put boots on the ground places and I got to do a real self-evaluation offensively on and defensively on where we stand and what things we're going to be good at and what things we need to emphasize in the summer and fall camp uh, in terms of opponents. A lot of people in college football will start preparing for opponents right now uh, with their graduate assistants and analysts breaking down film. So when the coaches return, they have a plan Uh I'm not one of those types of guys. Uh, I think sometimes you can collude your mind with too many ideas on game week. So we're going to leave uh, that to game week. So 10 days leading up to that game, we'll treat uh, that first game like it was a off week uh, by before. And we'll treat that game like a bye week in week one. And we'll get rolling with our normal schedule. But the only thing that we will do in the off season is we will practice unique looks. So, uh, you know, defensively, I know Oklahoma State is odd three high safeties. 
Uh, that is a unique thing that's usually it's normally in the Big 12 right now. Hasn't really faced the Pac-12 side of football yet. So we're going to have to practice that a little bit and, and go through that with our guys a little bit because it's unique. And then uh, offensively, any unique things that anybody that we face does in the entire Pac-12 will introduce to our guys just so they have a base understanding of what it looks like. Uh, it's not really for a specific team. It's more for a specific look or scheme that our offense doesn't run for our defense or our defense doesn't run for our offense. Hey, Coach, Alex Sutton, Cronkite Sports. Did you have any, or going into your spring game, um, did you have any unforeseen challenges that came up or even any fun surprises, just anything that you weren't expecting? Uh, no, to be honest. Uh, not really. I think everybody in the organization did a really nice job organizing it uh, pretty much to a T. I mean, even with, uh, you know, patch run and where do you park? And we knew where to park and we knew where to walk and uh, people were there at every step of the way. I mean, our guys had all that communication. So, I mean, I think uh, for the most part, it was fan experiences. The fans were on the field ready to roll. All the details were hammered out for two straight months. So I was actually pretty pleased. <clears throat> hey Kenny, Brad Denny, 3TV CBS 5. Obviously uh, roster management these days is uh, always a bit of a challenge. Um, would you and a staff kind of identify that, that a player might not necessarily be a great fit uh, with the program? What's that process like and just, you know, communicating that to a player and then helping them find another spot that is a good fit uh, and then kind of separate from that? Um, notice Chad Johnson Jr. is no longer on the roster. Is you, are you able to comment on his status? Yeah, so I think there's two sides to that question. One side is fit in terms of not buying into the culture and not doing the things that we ask them to do in terms of accountability. Uh, and that's one side of fit. And the other side of fit is really, it's not fit. It's just, uh, we want to be honest with guys. If most kids in college football want to play college football and after spring sitting down and telling guys, listen, you're the ninth wide out. Listen, you're the eighth DB. Listen, you're the three or four defensive tackle. And that's where you stand right now. If you want to stay here, great. We love your energy. We love your passion. You're going to be a part of this. But if you want to play football, right, you're down the depth chart. And I firmly believe in being honest with kids. Uh, it's not a fun conversation, but it's necessary because the most people want to keep kids on their roster to maintain the depth, right? Because you want to have the depth. But I just think that's not fair to kids that want the opportunity to play. And most coaches aren't, don't have those honest conversations with kids to say, listen, you're probably limited. You're going to have to come a long, long way to get on the field this year. And if those kids are juniors and seniors, it's, it's not fair to hide that from them. And then they got to make a decision. Do I want to be here, be a part of it, be on special teams, work my butt off? Or do I want to go in the portal and, and see if I can get somewhere that, got, that I can play? So I think it's two sides of it. Uh, there are going to be some guys. I mean, I started coaching at 17, which is very young. But, you know, Coach Samples was a four or five star recruit. And he hung up his career his sophomore, junior year and started coaching. And look at him. So there are guys that I ask, like, what do you want to do out of this? Like, what is your end game? And some of those guys say, I want to be a coach or I want to be a scout or I want to get involved in football. And it's maybe like, hey, like, let's start that part of your career to help you be successful in life and keep you on scholarship. So, I mean, there will be some guys in our team that stay on scholarship, right, get their degree, but also are being put in position to be successful in life because we're progressing them to the next step of their career, right, two to three years ahead of most people their age. So I think uh, two sides of, those, of that question, but I think it all comes down to honesty. We're not going to lie to a kid, even if we need him. If we need our third defensive tackle and he comes in and says, are you going to guarantee me I'm going to start? I'm going to say no. And if that kid transfers, he transfers. Because once again, this is a culture business. We're going to build this thing the right way. And if we have to take our lumps at times, uh, we're going to take our lumps. But we're going to do it through being honest and genuine with our players. Coach Michael Caratino, Sideline Sports, great to see you. Piggybacking off that, you led me into my question. I mean, with this being your first, not overall spring, but spring here, <laughs> and seeing guys 
like you said, going to the transfer portal. I know it's about competition and I don't like to use the word because I know as coaches, you guys, obviously you see something and you saw that you adjust. I don't like to use the word frustrated, but with some guys entering the transfer portal, like you said, being honest is huge, but is it almost kind of frustrating yeah. because like you said, in the fall, I mean, if they're competing and if they have a shot to compete and grow, is it almost frustrating from your standpoint as a coach and a coaching staff? Not at all. Uh, not at all. Actually, I firmly, I want people who walk into this building like in are ready to go every day. And the only way you don't get that is when people can't trust people. And every person in this building knows that, man, I met with Coach Dillingham and he told me where I stand. And if I want to change the narrative, these are the things I got to do. And if I don't, then he already told me what it looks like. So are there guys that I don't want to lose? Yes, there's a couple. But am I frustrated in any way, shape, or form? No, because the worst thing we could have is a player on our roster that is frustrated with his situation because we weren't honest with him. That's how one player, one bad apple grabs another, grabs another, grabs another. And that's how you, you become a, a team filled with, you know, guys that aren't passionate about walking into the building. So I tell guys, if you don't like this situation, you can stay here and change it, or we will help you find another place, but you're not going to stay here and be, you know, a Debbie Downer. Uh, that's not the culture I want to create. Thanks, Coach. Hey, Coach. Jake Seymour, Cronkite Sports. Uh, yesterday, there was a tweet that came out uh, that the program went out to Top Golf for a program event. Um, how was that experience? How important is that? And do you guys have any plans to do that, um, you know, throughout the rest of the offseason? Yeah, we'll do some fun things. I mean, we may go out, you know, potentially try to get out to a lake uh, or do something like that as a team or as position groups. And uh, like I said, I think, you know, just building building the relationships off the field with the guys. And uh, I love to do things that compete. So top golf's competition. I mean, I went and competed in top golf. I won and I'm not a good golfer. Then I went and competed in the pool table and I won and I'm not good at pool. Then I went and played shuffleboard and, and I won. So, I mean, it's just getting out there with the guys and competing. Like everything matters. Like, yes, it's fun, but winning is fun. Like, it's not fun to lose. So you have to build it. And everything we do is about teaching guys. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. You should have a sense of passion and energy and, and just wanting to win behind it. It shouldn't be, oh, I'm bad at this, so I'm not going to try. No, I'm bad at this. This is frustrating. I want to figure it out, right? So those events are really fun. They're really good. But they're my way to compete with the players because I tell them, if it takes athleticism, I got no chance. But if it doesn't take athleticism, bring it on. So that's kind of our rule with how I compete with them. Coach Greg Moore, Arizona Republic. Good to see you. Good to First see of you. all, and thanks for taking time when you don't feel well. You could easily push this thing or postpone it. I appreciate you making the time. Thank you, man. Of course. So I'm curious, how is it different or how is it similar to what you expected? It's been a few months now, got, you know, a little experience doing it. And now you've got a chance to look forward and, you know, you can imagine the next few months differently than you would have been able to a few months ago because you've been through some things now. So how is it similar? Uh, how is it different? And, and what do you expect coming forward? Yeah, I think, uh, it's, I mean, I, that's kind of what I expected. Uh, to be honest, uh, probably a little more administration stuff than I expected, but everybody tells you that that's what you become. So I was prepared for it, but until you're in it, it's not real. You know, it's one of those things until you do it, you don't know how much it is. So that's been a little bit of a, of a shock, but in terms of the football piece, in terms of the organizing practices and the recruiting and all that, uh, it, it's exactly what I expected. Uh, are there things that I'm going to learn from that I said, man, like, I didn't like our 14th practice. I didn't like how we did a little helmet jog through, run through, mixed with a walk through for an hour. I, I didn't like that. So I'm going to be creative with how we change that moving forward. So there are some things I, you know, I learned from and the staff's learning from. 
Uh, but pretty much what I expected without the time in terms of moving forward, I know the, the longer I'm in it, the less administrative stuff so I'm going to be able to do, I, I have to do. So the more football as we get into fall camp, I'll be able to do because uh, I am going to be involved heavily in game plans. Uh, so I'm going to have to structure our schedule to where I keep the main thing, the main thing. And that is I'm a football coach, right? When the season starts. And I'm going to have to, you know, remove myself so those other distractions and uh, keep the main thing, the main thing. You know, Kenny, a lot of people are going to talk about you being the youngest uh, Power Five uh, coach, but I think it's also something to be said, also being the first uh, alumnus coach uh, of the, uh, the uh, Arizona State football program. Um, you, ever since the introductory press conference, have not um, hidden whatsoever your passion and your love to this program. And obviously, one of the byproducts you want to see when you take that approach is to see uh, alum, alumni being involved uh, with the program. Obviously, got DJ Foster on your staff for an example. But when you just look at that specific aspect in the vacuum, how pleased have you been just with um, alumnus uh, reaching out, wanting to be more involved with the program, even if it's not, you know, being part of the staff like DJ, but just uh, coming in and interacting with the staff and with the players? Yeah, I mean, I've been really pleased. I mean, we've had guys that haven't been around the program uh, a lot the past few years or the last 10 years that are coming back around. I mean, I tell them all the time, like we told Jake the other day, uh, like, come around as much as you want. Like, our players see you, and it's different. You have Jaden Rashada in there who grew up an ASU fan, grew up watching Jake Plummer, and, like, he sees Jake Plummer out there, and he gets nervous a little, like, whoa. Like, that's Jake Plummer. And that's needed. That's healthy. I mean, you have the Todd Heaps of the world out there. I mean, you need that, right, environment for your players to feel that these former players care and they're watching you. And uh, so I've been very pleased with the former players and their interaction with the program. And I want more. Like, I, and I, and I, like the more they want to be around, I, I, the more they're allowed to be around. Right? There's not going to be a limit to that. Kenny, I, I know it's an ever-changing landscape, but do you have a, a sense of um, maybe the breakdown of where players in the next year or two will come from distribution-wise, transfer, D1, JUCO, high school? What's your thoughts on that? So Yeah, our approach is, is going to be, in most years in the past, you only have 25, so you have to sign a certain amount every year. All right, because if you don't, that's how your roster becomes unbalanced, because if you don't sign 20 a year, right, or 22 a year, then eventually you're under the 85 and you could never make it up. With the current rules and the landscape of college football changing, we're going to set a standard for what we think is a player that can help us win this league. And if we're going to recruit those players as hard as possible, and if we strike out on those players, we're not going to lower the bar and grab somebody out of the high school ranks that we don't feel like can win us a championship, which means we'll supplement that uh, with somebody from the portal and or and then wait until we get the players necessary to win a championship. So I would say really hard to talk through the numbers of each position because I don't know if we can bring in three corners that can help us win this league that we rate as we watch them as good enough, we're gonna bring in three corners. If we try to bring in uh, three tight ends and we go 0 for 6 on our on the six tight ends we feel can help us win this league, we're not going to go down the board to reach for a kid because that's how you get a roster uh, that you had to build in the past. But it, with the current rules, you don't have to build the roster like that anymore. I'd rather wait, hold the spot, and then get somebody out of the portal. And then in three years from now, four years from now, we would have recruited at each position the top players. So when those players re-enter the portal, we would have been the school that kept recruiting them even after they were gone. So I want to sign high school kids. That's the goal. Uh, that's the vision to, to build them. But we're not going to reach uh, anymore. I don't think that's necessary. And just to follow up on that, is it, if I understand correctly, sometimes you may be recruiting local kids, not necessarily to take them in. I think we lost you, Chris. We lost you, but I know what you said. I could read your lips. So you, I, I would assuming you asked not to take them now, but to take them if they transfer back home and then the bounce back. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, just oh, 
We're yeah. on the same page. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, we're definitely looking to build the relationships with guys that we think are good enough to help us win this league. And I think that's the key, is it's not which kids can we get. That's not the model anymore. The model was which kids are recruitable, right? And I think if you continue to go to the model of concede defeat and which kids are actually recruitable, then you're going to fill your roster with guys that are a little bit below where you could. Our model is we're going to evaluate all the kids in the state, all the kids nationally, but we feel like we win a championship with. And if we don't sign them, we it's okay. We're going to keep recruiting them. If they don't have any interest, we're going to keep recruiting them. If they commit somewhere, we're going to keep recruiting them, right? That way, if they do transfer in a year or two, right, we would have had relationships with all the kids in the state, all the kids nationally uh, that enter the portal. You know, right now it's about 30% of kids will eventually enter the portal, right, is what they're saying. So if we recruit 10 in a position and three of those 10 enter in two years, all we have to do is get one of those three now and we signed a prospect that people said, you know, we weren't going to get to begin with. Hey coach. So you're home now, but you had your journey up to this point, lots of experiences under different staffs. Uh, I'm curious how your approach as a first year head coach now uh, sort of reflects some of the qualities of previous coaches you've worked under. Yeah, I think Mike Norvell, just from the consistency of who he was, he was the same person as a head coach every day. Uh, you knew what you were going to get. Different personality than me, but the same in terms of the approach. Uh, and then you combine that with physicality. Uh, you can't cut corners in physicality. Uh, it's There's only one way to get physical, and that's the practice physical, right? So I think Mike Norvell has really been a huge, uh, you know, mentor in terms of how I operate, in terms of how we do things. Uh, and then you combine that with, you know, Gus Malzahn, uh, Staying at that level for that long as a head coach, I learned how to manage people and the leadership council piece. That was one thing that I took from him is like get a group of 10 guys to become a leadership council to throw ideas off of uh, because those are that's the team and people are willing to talk in smaller settings and combine that with Dan Lanning, who I got to learn, you know, the defensive head coach side. Uh, which helps me become balanced, which is how defenses install things and how they need practice run in order to get better. So I think those three things or those three guys all gave me different experiences in terms of, you know, how I how I want to run it. And then you got to combine that with my own personality because kids see fake. So if, if I try to come out here and be somebody I'm not, they're going to see right through it. So you combine all those experiences with who I am as a person and combine it. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, Coach, uh, I know the number may change, um, but do you know about how many more players you're going to be looking for out of the portal and specifically what positions? Yeah, I mean, the number may change right now. We need an O-lineman. Uh, we need a D-lineman interiorly, obviously, uh, and we need a linebacker, right? Other than that, if, uh, if somebody comes available that's an elite player, uh, then obviously we have enough room to take those elite players. We're, we're building in enough room. Uh, hopefully those guys are younger. Uh, I would like to add, if we add people other than those three that I just mentioned, I'd like them to be younger guys that maybe are, you know, we can develop or uh, maybe have, you know, three to four years left. Uh, just because we need to fill in the back of our roster more, like I said, based off the 22 class and the lack of additions, we need to fill that void. Uh, so I would say those three and then uh, maybe one or two wild cards uh, for some a young pup. Thank you. Hey, coach, I just wanted to ask where you see the offensive line at this point in time. And I mean, you mentioned that you're going after one in the transfer portal, but do you think that is a primary area of focus to improve before fall camp? Yeah, I mean, I think depth is definitely a primary area of focus at that position. If you don't go into the season with eight to nine guys that you feel like are starting caliber players, you're just asking to play in a game uh, and just be in trouble. So I think what our focus is, can we bring in the best player possible? Uh, you know, what? who's the best O-lineman that we can bring in to help us? And that's really the challenge. But our guys know that we need, we need more uh, guys at that spot 
uh, especially with the, you know, a few guys moving on uh, in order to go play and try to be a starter somewhere else, uh, you know, after those honest conversations that they know that we need uh, a few guys to bolster that room. Coach Greg Moore again. Um, curious about the fan energy and how has Phoenix treated you since you've been home? Oh, Phoenix has been great. I mean, this is this is home. I run into people all the time. People I know, people who know my my mother-in-law, people who know my dad, people who know my brother, people who know my sister, people whose kids I coached at youth dodgeball leagues. Uh, I mean, I was at a restaurant yesterday and I coached their nephew uh, at Cocoa Paw Middle School, a dodgeball team when I was 19. Uh, so it's just one of those deals. The city's been great. It's unbelievable. Uh, I know our ticket sales have been out the roof right now. I mean, unbelievably out the roof, uh, breaking records in recent history. So I'm, I'm just excited for the support that we're getting right now. And it, it fires me up. Okay. I think that's all the questions. If everyone's good, it kind of wraps up coaches time. Um, thank you everyone for joining and we'll, we'll send this video out if anyone needs it, but thank you coach. And thanks everyone. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Me. Appreciate y'all. Go Devils. <laughs>